morning, everyone, and welcome to the Global Energy Review of 2019. Thanks so much for joining us at over 125 different venues across the globe on December 14th to host these events. A huge thanks to all the organizers who made this event possible. So, organizers, please get up and attendees give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Last years, it's going to be years in March. Uh, I work with our partners, particularly with all the ISP partners. Uh, these are independent software vendor, which means company that actually makes software as for they do. And um, I work mostly with them uh, primarily on that and all that Azure has to offer. Uh, my talk today with you is about Azure machine learning, but I want to have it a little bit more of a discussion. Um, I have a Good content is going to probably take us 40, 45 minutes, but I really want to have you interact with me, ask me questions, uh, happy to interrupt the show, interrupt the presentation, and make your questions. So let's keep it um, informal. So I've seen a couple of sessions before, my session, the two sessions before lunch, and they were actually very good, very nice introductions. Some of the content overlaps with what's been already said, so I assume that many of you have already uh, seen those sessions, so I'll, I'll just cover over the content. I wouldn't spend too much time. Um, how long do you think machine learning has been around? It's been very hot for the last couple of years, but how long do you think it's been there before these last two years? Can you name a year? So it's, I think, uh, 15, yeah. And that was the first uh, machine learning uh, practical experiment that was done on the Chepa game. Uh, what's really interested me, if you, if you go back to these years, which I, I haven't looked in those years, but I could only imagine the, the, the way software development used to be. And if you could think how many options you have in the check of game. So if you want to put this in if statements all over a spaghetti random routine, there's going to be multiple thousands fine. Just to capture the different options you will have with every single move you could ever make. And in that time, they did 700 instructions just to do the analytical routines. Very, very impressive. If you think about the efficiency of going back in time, back today. So I think that's, that's the beauty of the machine learning, is where you could um, optimize the learning patterns without having to code every single if statement yourself. That's how I try to perceive them. Um, to me, in a sense, really machine learning is really embedded into the mathematics, into the statistical analysis. This is really where it came from. But when I read about it, when I learn more about it, I took in three paradigms of the machine learning. There is the um, Fundamental, the predictive analysis, which is really statistics. And on top of that, we go into the text and the vision and the speech, which are all different applications of the fundamental predictive analysis. So if we want to maybe spend just five minutes, um, how many people in the room are, or brand themselves are data scientists, perceive themselves as data scientists? Fair. Yeah. How many perceive themselves as data engineers or database engineers? Nice. Is all the rest software developers? Ish? Yes? <laughs> How many of you have never been in a machine learning session has nothing to do with software or just personally interested in the topic? Nice. Alright. So I wanna I wanna have that talk tailored to all of you. So if you feel a little bit too slow. Bear with me, it's going to get a little bit faster after, all right? So this is usually what you do in statistics. You have a table of data that gets to have numeric values or categorical values. And you really want to predict an outcome based on the existing data set you have. 
glass particle of the predictor and glass particle of the independent variable. This is just classical stats. And if the independent variable, sorry, the dependent variable is categorical, you call it classification. You use classification algorithms. If you're predicting a numeric value, a salary, age, uh, area, that will be regression. They call them regression uh, analysis. Both classification and regression uh, classified as supervised learning because I know exactly what the income was for my data set and I want to predict the income of a new person. So I'm very targeted. I know what the outcome might be. In the unsupervised learning, I don't really have an idea what the outcome is really. I just throw in the data and I will ask the algorithm to give me patterns that are statistically significantly different between themselves. Okay? So this is like a, a server log. And you can see there's an outlier that happened at some point in time. And maybe you could you will possibly see there are different patterns in the data set. And that's what the clustering algorithm will find for you. Right? These are different paradigms that you can see the data that are statistically different from each other. So far so good? Yeah. Nice. So this is the summary. Supervised versus unsupervised. Regression classification versus clustering and anomaly detection. Okay, this, is, this is the simplest way uh, I could put this for you. In Azure Machine Learning, we have a bunch of algorithms already made available for you in the services we have, but they really evolve around the same thing. Anomaly detection, clustering, regression, and classification. And you really want to familiarize yourself with these terms. I don't think they are really hard. It's just the term seems not intuitive to me, so I, I wanted to make sure you're comfortable with it. And probably the rest of the talk will be just looking over the field. Okay. So in the earlier slide, we said these are predictive analytics. These are the fundamentals of machine learning. But there are also voice and speech and text. So when you do text, you will call it natural language processing, NLPs. How do you think that works? So when, it's num when the sample data is numbered data set, it's a numbered or calculated data set, we saw how we could play with it, right? I could predict either a numeric value, or I predict a categorical value, or I ask for patterns that are different. But if it was a text, how do I do that? Sorry? Any suggestions? Sorry? Yes. Yes. So to me, when I was coming into the field, I was trying to think, how would they ever do it? And I was really thinking at the time, it has to be something related to the um, language itself, to the dictionary, to the grammatic, to the meaning of the words, and how they could probably cluster it in, in some way. So they could find sentiment analysis, they could find some insight from a text. Um, I was disappointed because I was wrong. It turned out many of these text analytics has nothing to do with what the text really is. It's a very vector-based analysis. And this is an example I find it very easy to explain. Don't take it as this is text analytics. This is just how to understand how it works. It's a little bit more complicated than this to the point that I don't really actually comprehend. But this is how I understand the basics of it. So think about this corpus. Corpus is, is, a, is a text that you are going to analyze. It's three sentences. John likes to watch movies, but he likes movies too. John also likes football. Okay? So the way you vectorize the text, you build an index. You index every single word that show up in the text. And then you build the matrix. So these are three lines mirrors the three sentences, and every time the word shows up, you plug it to the line. And by doing so, now you have a two-dimensional array to, rep 
represent how your words were represented in the text. We good? So this was an experiment from 2013. Mark Kolov is, is the scientist who has done this experiment. He took a huge data set, corpus, that's what we call it, right? It's a text that I'm going to analyze. Sorry. Sorry, just one moment to interrupt. Um, we have some hot, fresh pizzas outside, including two vegetarian pizzas. If you did not get your vegetarian choice for yourself, uh, it's available out outside, as, as well as if you're still hungry, there's uh, some great Hawaiian pizzas outside as well. Sorry for the interruption. Of course, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what he did, he took a, a large set of text, I think it was a news broadcast, and he did exactly what I showed you before. He did the vectorization. He tried to position every single word in that huge text into a matrix, into a vector state. And he built a 1,600-dimensional matrix for that. It's a huge. I can't possibly imagine what that really means. But I think mathematically, it's, it's viable. When he did that, he concluded that the semantics of the word, the way they show up in that 1600 dimensional matrix, does not reflect the relationship in the semantics between these words. What does that mean? So if I were to draw the word king and the word queen on that multidimensional plane, the distances between a queen and a king very similar to the distance between a man and a woman, or a male or a female. Which is very, very magical to me. I would have never believed it. I think the fact is, whatever you use the word man, and then eventually use the word woman, or a male or a female, or a Mr. and Mrs., it's the same pattern when you use a king and queen. It just happens to be natural the way you express it in a human readable text. And so you could actually build that relationship. Uh, another example, a city and a capital, uh, sorry, a capital city and a country, they always show in the same distances between each other. Um, so this is, this is the whole idea of trying to find semantics in the text through doing mathematical analysis, not grammatical or, or the lexicon analysis based on the text and what it really means. Which really means you could run the same algorithm regardless of which language you're looking at. It has nothing to do with dictionary, it has nothing to do with your grammatic. It's really about the positioning of the word within the text. Okay? We good? Enough for a warm up after lunch? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, any of you touched? Seen, heard about Azure? Okay, everyone, cool. Any of you did something in Azure? No. Who said no? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for being here today. And actually, thank you for all you know being here, and thanks for having us to host the event. Uh, very nice turnout. I'm sure it's not weather related. I'm sure you're actually interested in the event because it was sold out before the snow came in. So thank you. Thank you for showing up. We have a lot of services in Azure that um, were designed and served for the machine learning community or the people who are in the field and, and doing that type of workloads. I don't think we'll have the time to go through all of them, but they are really a lot. I just want to draw your attention on what are we going to talk about today. The one all the way to the right top. I'm sorry, my slide is a little bit dated. Um, it used to be in preview, now it's totally available. Now it's actually um, an available service. Okay? I don't want to really confuse you with how and what to use when. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about the Azure Machine Learning Services for today, the very first one. Uh, feel free to connect with me. I'm happy to you know, talk to you about the different use cases, where to use what. Okay? On a high level, the difference between what we call AI and machine learning, machine learning when I actually train the dataset myself. 
when I sit down and think hard, I want to draw insight from the data set, I want to predict something from my data set, and when I do it myself, then I'm doing really machine learning. That's how we see it. AI is something that someone has done for you and you're just consuming it. So for example, the face recognition APIs that you use you know, on Google, on Microsoft, on Facebook, to us, this is more of an AI, not really machine learning, because you're not training the model, you're not training with a million of faces and trying to do that. It's been already done for you. So you use it as a service, right? That's the major distinction. And then, you know, the tree is pretty much self externally If you want to do coding versus graphical way, there's a tool that is very graphical oriented, and there's a tool that is very coding oriented. Today, in my session, we get into the coding oriented, and I'm sorry, it's going to be some Python code. Uh, anyone like Python code? Ooh. Anyone doesn't like Python code? <laughs> I don't like it, but it doesn't really matter what I like. Uh, the community that likes it. Um, it's been the number one development language everywhere you go. Uh, I struggled with it. I was up until three and last time because it didn't work. It used to work. It didn't work yesterday. I had to figure out why. And honestly, I couldn't figure out why. I had to pull a, a notebook that I had from last month. Play it again and then go back steps by step until it worked out. Okay. So I'm going to be flipping out the code. Things are going to look a little bit more dry. Bear with me. What I will be doing, I will take a data set. It's about diabetes patients with 10 fields. These 10 fields we just saw, we call them independent variables. And I will try to predict the 11th field, which is a numeric value, doesn't mean a lot, but it means the probability of a patient coming back again to the diabetic episodes. What I will do, I will take the data sets, experiment with them. With experimenting mean, I will try different things to get the highest possible score. Once I do that, once I figure my sweet spot, I know what model, which parameters <coughs> will help me get that super model, I will register the model. The term, register the model, it's very Azure machine learning service C. It doesn't mean really anything, it's just for us. Which means I'm promoting that model to be considered going forward. That's the best model I have. Okay? So I register the model, and then I will create a Docker image. Anyone doesn't know what a Docker image means? Okay. It's a container when you package a code into a container so it's easier to deploy. Um, it's something that you would use and deploy a Kubernetes cluster or a VM on a Docker swarm. In simplest term, it's an abstraction of your code that you could deploy on any um, Docker friendly environment. Okay. So back again, I will build a model. I will explore with it until I have the best model. I will register the model. I will create a Docker image. And then I will deploy the Docker image as a web service. You cool? And then I will go to Core BI consume that web service to predict my Excel sheet. I have the same Excel sheet in Power BI sitting and waiting. It has all the 10 fields. I want to predict the 11th field. And I think what I'm trying to impress you with, how am I going to do that from the Power BI side without having to write a single line of code? It's seemingly seamlessly integrated. Cool? Uh, yes? Uh, is it? the Docker containerization for, for your code. Is it important? Is it something that we should do in order to work or generate this web service? So if, if I have that code, for example, if I write my, I'm just making it up, my, my Python code, right? Um, can it work? Good question. So, anyone didn't hear the question? All right. Do you mind if you stand up yeah, and say the question? <laughs> Of course. Uh, uh, what I was asking about is, is it mandatory that I have to containerize my code, the algorithm that I wrote, or, or this is just from simplicity point of view? Right. So, so. Nice. 
So we're not going to go too, too much into containerization and the modern architecture and the benefits and the drawbacks. But on a high level, no. You don't have to containerize your code. But if I were to deploy that Python web service into, let's say, a Kubernetes or even a VM, just a VM, I will then have to install Python on that VM to be able to run the code. So when I containerize it, I become self-dependent, self-dependent, yes. I will, I'll become independent by self-dependent. I can take my container, pull it anywhere, push it anywhere I want, without having to install Python, without having to install the machine learning libraries, which is from Skylum. It's all into one really set of files. Take it go wherever you want, all right? The Azure Machine Learning Service, and it's actually very important, and that's a way into that discussion. We at Microsoft did not reinvent the wheel. We are not into the business of developing the new Python or the best development language. Bruno showed a very nice demonstration about ML.net. <coughs> it's an option. It's not the only option. So in the Azure Machine Learning Services, what we try to do is that let's stay away from the open source and what's going on. We will contribute to it, but we don't want to productize on that because it's just too fluid. It's a lot going on. And if we're going to compete with that, we're going to lose. It's a very aggressive innovation side. So instead, we focus a little bit more. Let's build a platform that is library agnostic. You want to run Python, you want to run R, .NET, C Sharp, Java, you, you say it. But I want to orchestrate the experimentation, the model registration, the image creation, deployment and consumption of the model. And do it in the life cycle patterns, I have a full CICDs, what we call ML ops, as opposed to DevOps, machine learning ops. Cool? Yeah. All right. So, here we come. This is my Azure in case anyone hasn't seen. I have two resource groups. The below one is the plan B, and it's the best plan. You always start with the plan B, so that if it doesn't work out, you have something to fall back to. So I have you covered. I have a plan B, which is working in plan, so I'm not too worried. We'll try to do the boot camp fresh and light. If we hit code buffers, I'll go back to the existing code. So in here, I have already created a machine. Yes? It's too small, right? Yeah. Okay. How is it now? Still too small? Yeah, the problem when it gets bigger is will yeah. it will eat up the screen. So I'll meet you half, but I'll meet you at 125. Uh, I'll I'll make the content very condensed, so we'll, we'll make it more readable. So I didn't create other machine learning service. And what it really does for me, it spins a couple of VMs machines, we call them nodes, that will house whatever code I would want to run. Okay? I'll just show you how it actually get created, but I will use the one that I created earlier okay, because it's going to take a few minutes to spin and I don't want to use those two minutes. So I come here and I say um, Azure Machine Run. I say create. And when I say create, it will ask me about my subscription ID, the resource group that I want to have it in, and so forth. All right? Again, I can cancel it because I already did that. And I will take you to my resource, uh, to my workspace. Workspace is your workspace. It's your desktop and the Azure machine and services. This is where everything can happen. 
right? So I want you to look on the left side here. These are the key components of Azure Machine Learning Services. I will start with compute, and I will organically walk you through it. I will not talk to you right away. I will let you know which component means what at our time. Okay? I will not be talking about pipelines and activities. Okay, so no disappointments. Just for, for time reason. When I go to compute, compute really, really means a VM, a virtual machine. How many virtual machines I want to have? Okay? I did spawn, I did spin a, a virtual machine uh, this morning. Um, and we're going to experiment with that virtual machine. All right? Anyone doesn't know what the notebook is, Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so you don't know what Jupyter Notebook is. It's the editor for Python, one of the most popular editors for Python. Think about Visual Studio for C Sharp and .NET, or Eclipse for Java, Jupyter for Python. All right? And on these virtual machines, if I create a new virtual machine, it comes equipped with Python and Jupyter. So you don't have to install it. So this is my Jupyter. I did create a folder for us today, for bootcamp. Empty, nothing. Okay. And that's on purpose. I want to show you how I'm going to build it you know, step by step. Now, before I go there, we, in Microsoft, we've been very super focused on open source, and we've been open sourcing all the platform work we've been doing so far. All right? And you will find that in here. <laughs> that's the GitHub repository, which is exactly the same as this one. The Azure ML samples. <laughs> If you go explore them, it's one to one to the guitar. Okay? The example I talked to you about that I'm going to build a model, register the model, deploy the model, consume the model in Power BI. I work at Microsoft and I struggled for months until I get that all sorted out. Because the documentations and the GitHub examples are super laser focused on one case at a time, it doesn't give you the full use case. So I have to stitch it together. If you try to stitch it yourself, it will not work. There are a couple of things that were missing that I was able to pull out thanks to our engineering team they helped me out. I'm hoping today, you know, by your attendance, I did um, a fork from the GitHub, and I did that change, and I will submit it to the engineering team. Hopefully they will accept it, so that example will become available on the Microsoft GitHub. If it's not, it's on my GitHub. You must welcome to go and explore it. And in fact, I want to encourage you, should you come across any discrepancies in the GitHub, please submit pull request. The engineering team closely monitor and monitor and encourage your contribution. All right? So I'm going to go to my GitHub, which is a fork. A fork means it's a branch. I took exactly the same code from Microsoft. GitHub into my personal GitHub. And you would, you know, soon you would appreciate how hefty that GitHub really is, and it's not really easy to navigate. So you have to come to this folder. And then you have to come to this folder. Okay? And I'll do the same thing into the Microsoft GitHub. You come to how to use, and then you come to training. So there are seven examples in the Microsoft GitHub. What I did last night, I created the seventh example for Power BI. Oh. And what is really, it's only one Python Jupyter model. That's all it is. So what I will do, I will take this Python, push it 
on the other dimension on the surface. Again, I, I, I can do it in a very rudimentary way. I will just copy paste the file. We go so far, everyone is following? Awesome. So that's my Jupyter. And now I will upload the Jupyter, the Jupyter notebook. Because I'm very spoiled by real estate here, told them, this is your mistake, and this is what went wrong, and this is how it goes, this is how you should do it, with the intelligence. I didn't, I'm sure if I do a bit more diligence, I will find somewhere where you have the intelligence on Python, uh, but I haven't done that yet. All right, so let's go into the Jupiter. So one thing I want to show you, all the way to the right, this is a Python 3.6 Azure ML, and you could actually choose a different version. So uh, Matthias, uh, earlier today, he was doing a Python 2.0. I could move to a Python 3.6 without Azure ML. Azure ML is really an SDK, that's really what it is, on top of Python. And what it does for you, really, it makes generating the Docker containers to form the web services really a single line of code for you. It wraps everything behind the scene for you. So if, you, if you've done any Docker container before, you know the steps that involves to build a Docker container. It's a lot of steps, not a lot. There's a dozen of steps that you have to do, and you have to be careful how you do them. The Azure ML does that for you transparently. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? Recall should be brought to you. I will teach you through, but if you want to go after, it's all documented in the same notebook, what I'm trying to do, all right? So in the first step here, this is just a warm-up step. I'm going to execute a problem I will have to log in. This is just to authenticate. It will use my uh, credentials to connect the Jupyter with my Azure account. All I need to do is to go through the website and then put the code in. It's very similar how you authenticate with PowerShell and Azure. It's the same process. And now maybe I'll get this message. Let's see. Nope, yeah, awesome. So now you see I'm authenticated. This is the workspace I'm using, workspace bootcamp. It's been deployed in the East US region. We have 52 or 54 regions in Azure. Uh, I decided to deploy the ACS just because I want it. This is the data set. And the data set comes from scikit-learn.org. Um, you can find the details of our data set. It's actually in here. Just make sure I put it for you. So, Scikit-learn is an open source uh, machine learning algorithms and data sets. Um, the one we we're using is about the diabetes. That's the one we're using today. And that's where you find the data sets. And if you follow through the guide, you will get to know these are the 10 fields, you know, the age and gender and what have you. And this is the, the exact data set. It's 422 rows. If I click on them, um, I think that's the data here. Six different um, 
to our control units. Okay? There we go. So what I'm doing here really, I want you to focus on this. I'm splitting 80% of the data to be my um, training data and 20% to be my test data. Anyone is not aware of training versus test data sets? Cool. So I'm putting by 80-20. I have to change the number. People who want to do 70, 30, 80, 20 is not a big deal. So of the 422, 353 are training, and the rest is going to be a test. And now we're going to train. So remember we talked about classification, regression, and the other things? These are the, the four pillars, if you will. If you go into regression, there are tons of uh, regression algorithms that you could use. In every algorithm, there is a number of parameters that you could tune the algorithm. Recall? So if I want to do regression, the first decision I have to make, which algorithm should I do? Decision tree, uh, NLP, I have to decide. Deep learning. Once I pick the algorithm, the algorithm has some tuning parameters. And then I have to decide, okay, which tuning parameters should I use? And how do I use it? It becomes very complicated. And that's when you actually need it to so you can tell you. So in this case, we are going to use the um, regression model. It's called the Ridge regression model. You could Google and read about it. I don't know what that really means. It's one of the regression models that I'm going to use. And that regression model has a parameter called alpha. You could tune that parameter to sharpen your score, to sharpen the accuracy of your score. In this one, and I call it experiment because I'm not really sure yet. I'm going to play with it, see what I find fit. So I'm starting with alpha being 0.03. It's just a tuning parameter. It has some mathematical significance. I don't know really what that means. Neither do I really care. What I care with, which alpha one should I use to give me the highest accuracy level possible? All right? And the way, in this example at least, they're trying to measure the accuracy by the mean squared error. It's just a number to show you uh, how off your prediction was compared to the actual. So watch for this number. The lower this number is, the more accurate we are. Okay? So for the parameter that was 0.03, I was able to get 3,424. 3, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do something called parameter sweep. I will loop over the possibilities of outcomes and measure the outcome to see which one actually is full of, which is what Azure or any outward ML will do for you. They will do that sweep for you. They will try every single combination of every algorithm and every tuning parameter to give you the highest possible accuracy rate. If I'll do it with five and four in each loops, it's going to be such a long time to get to that. In this example, though, I'm going to do a, a four in each loop. Before I do that, I want to take you back because now we have one of the assets already part, uh, talking about the experiment. We just run one with the alpha 0.03. That was my first experiment, and I get 3,400 something error rate, um, squared error value. <coughs> I had one run only, I had one experiment only, and that was my error rate, 3,400 something. Okay? It's one experiment so far. Going back to the Python, 
Now what I will do, I'm running a loop from 0 to 1, stepping on point 1, point 1, point 1, so point 1, point 2, point 3, point 4. I'm going to run 10 iterations to find which of the 10 alphas will give me the lowest error rate possible. We all following? Yeah. Nice. Any questions? It's going to take probably 20 seconds. Any questions in the meantime? <coughs> So if, if you read like on top here, I'm not importing anything from Azure ML. Anyway. This is this is flat Python. NumPy is run Python libraries. You could run this on any Python notebook. The only difference is this Python notebook now is married to my uh, analysis services that are running behind. So it could track the experimentation, it could track the model. So we have we have a run. The ten of them, all of them, they run successfully. And now, I can see the experimentations. If I click on the link, which I wouldn't, but if I would, it will come, bring me back again to the experimentation here. Which if I would refresh. See? Now I have 10 runs. From alpha point 0.1 through alpha point 0.9. And this is my error rate. Could anyone tell me which alpha is the coolest alpha? Which alpha that actually gave me the lowest error rate? Six. Nice. Was it easier for you to check it on the grid or on the graph? Hold on the graph. This is number six. That's the lowest one. Okay? But you see the value now, right? I'm not, if I go back to my Python, I don't really see it. I have to write the code to spit one by one. But if I go to my studio, it has all the numbers lined up. Now comes even a better part. This code now, which is again, it's purely Python. Because I have all my run registered in my machine learning environment, it will iterate through them and pick the best one based on the lowest error margin. It will just run, run the loop across a ton of them and it will identify the alpha was 0.4, which was the sixth run, and that was the best one. So let's read up. We did experimentation, and we have now identified the best model. We know what the best model is. The best model is with alpha 0.04. Sorry, 0.4, alpha 0.4, that's the best model. What I want to do now, I want to register the model. And why do I do that? Because when I do that, if I come to my Azure environment again, my model will show up here. Nothing is shown up yet, because the, I didn't tell Azure what is my model yet. I'm still experimenting. All I see is experimentation. I'm not seeing any models yet. Now I want to declare to Azure, hey, listen, I now have a model. Please register it, because I have someone to do with it. So this code will register the model, and clearly now you see we're using Azure ML now. This is not part of anymore, this is Azure ML. But you could also appreciate how organically integrated it really look and feel like the Python, but it's actually uh, an Azure SDK. And what I'm doing here, I'm creating the pickle file. Anyone heard of the pickle file? Yes. What the pickle file is, that's the model file. So one of the, the interesting things that I have, when you do machine learning, think about a human learning. How many books you've read in your life to be able to comprehend the language? A lot of books. But when I want to read a new book, I don't need all these books that I read before. I've only gained that knowledge. So in machine learning, same story. If I want to train the model, I need terabytes and terabytes of data to build a very solid model. Once the model is built, the model is really a mathematical equation. It's very small. It's in kilobytes, even in megabytes. Very small. You can build it with terabytes and terabytes of data. Once you build it, it's a very small equation. That's all that you say. And that equation lives in this pickle file. In this case, I call it the diabetes model. 
which I am registering now. Done, registered. It should show up here. We go. So now we have experimented, we have chosen the best model, we have registered the model. Going forward, this is just verifying, okay, it was registered and that's the version name I got. It's number eight because it was a wrong night for me last night, I did it seven times, so every time you do it, it gets another version number. And this is very important for data scientists because oftentimes you will keep iterating, 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 and then you know what? The one I did yesterday was the best one. I want to go back to it. The machine learning services will keep that track for you. So now I'm building the scoring file. For the software developers in the room, I'm actually not building the web service. I'm building the code. What are the input parameters and what are the output parameters? And because I want to consume it eventually from Power BI, I have to make it um, by the swab or definitions. So it's self-explanatory. And this is what the code is doing. I'm defining my input parameters, which are the 10 fields. And I'm defining here the schema decorators and the schema auto generation to make it uh, swagger friendly. All right? Now, now I have the manifest written for the web service. How I will deploy it? I'll want to deploy it as a container. And the container will be the configuration file. So now I'm screening up the configuration file. There is unfortunately a trick here I couldn't find out yet. Remember I told you if you go on the code it will not work for you because there's a problem here. When I get the YAML file with that step, there is one thing I need to do. And that one thing, I'm sorry it looks really stupid but it is what it is. This one. And by the way, if this line is not invented, it will not work. And that was two weeks work for me. Mm -hmm. Not what? <laughs> you the space. Okay? So all I need to do is bring that into the arm. Which I don't have it I need to be very careful because Python is very space sensitive. And frankly, why, why this is a missing piece? This statement is required for the Swagger implementation. So the service will expose itself according to the Swagger API. And because the Power BI team is a different documentation than the GitHub team, you don't find it in either way. So the Power BI is saying you have, it has to be a Swagger compliant. The GitHub doesn't really say how you do that. You have to figure it out. And I ended up figuring it out. Oh, so now I saved it. I have the configuration file. I have the scoring file, which actually explains the web service what input, what output parameters it should have. I think we're ready to spin our Docker image. Okay? Which I, I'm going to call image diabetes model. This may take uh, some time, hopefully up to one point, a couple of minutes. And when that is done, it will show up in the image here. We go. That is too fast. I'm not sure. That's the one. So by the way, you know, you ask the question, does it have to be containerized? The answer is, for now, yes, in the Azure machine learning world. However, you do have options. But this is definitely too small. It's too small for you, right? So there is compute targets and there is deployment targets. Compute targets is the VM that I use to run my experimentation, to calculate my alpha. That was the compute. And if you notice, when I did 10 iterations, it took 30 seconds. This is a small CSV, 400 line CSV. 
If this was one terabyte, the machine will choke for a week before it will spit it up. And then I will need to build a cluster, multiple nodes running at the same time. That's a compute node to calculate the model, to you know, obtain the model. Once I have the model, I want to deploy the model. That becomes your deployment targets, which in this case we're deploying to a Docker container. I was very happy to see <coughs> there is an option coming up for Azure Functions. To me, that's easier. That is more high-level language, C sharp, Java, PHP, I could do Azure Functions now. Um, it would be easier. It's still in preview, as you can see. It's not really available yet, but it will become awesome. So you don't really have to memorize it. Okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I have an assumption that um, whenever you run those iterations like every time, and I think the, the model is going to be measure the service is going to be faster, right? As you bring in more data, will it? I think it can become smarter, right? I need mean, to find the association. So. Uh, I think that will be on you to make it happen. It will not happen by itself. So what, what it does, if you go back to the alpha example, if you want to come into the you're going to get the same problem. If you bring, if you bring a new data set, there will be a different term. Yeah. But if you repeat the same data set over and over again, it is not going to run from yeah. these iterations. Yeah, what I mean is just you bring the data. Yes, so that, to me, it's more of on the experimentation side, trying different algorithms, trying different parameters, playing with your data. So uh, Matthias, he showed actually a very nice example of if I want to quantify a kind of particle value, red, green, yellow, should I go one, two, three? One, two, three may be a of a challenge because two is twice as one. But the color doesn't have that notion of twice as the other color. So you have to figure out how you how you get that. All right, we have the image done. So I should see the image here now, which I demanded. I will see it in the camera. But point is, we have the image ready. So can anyone tell me what the next step will be? Register the image. Pardon? You have to register the image. Uh, I just created the image. Yes. The file. That's right. That's right. So, can anyone tell me how and where to I deploy a Docker image? CR. That's right. You can deploy it to a Kubernetes. You can deploy it to a VM that is running any Docker uh, uh, hosting environment. Uh, you could deploy it to um, Docker Swarm. You could also deploy it to Azure Container Instance. What Azure Container Instance is, think about there is a VM that has a Docker host up and running all the time for you. You pay for the second. You don't have to pay for the VM. You don't have to install Docker. It's all set up for you. You just spin it up for 10 seconds and then shut it down. You pay only for these 10 seconds. It's very compact, very hard, but it's a little bit more expensive than doing it yourself. So what I will do now, I will ship that model to the Azure Container Instance and it will become live. You cool? So that's the image I created. It's just some metadata. I'm now spinning an Azure Container Instance that has one CPU, one gigabyte of memory, and I will spin it in Canada Central Region. It's a downtown data center we have. And this should take a couple more minutes. While this is coming up, when this is done, I will have a URL for that web service. That web service will take 10 input parameters and will give me one output parameter. While this is running, I will now go to Power BI because I want to consume it from Power BI without tracking code in Power BI. That's what I promised you. Anyone has seen Power BI before? Yes. So I'm sorry I will not be able to 
to give it justice. So I will just assume everyone is aware of our DI. And if you're not, think about it. It's Excel on steroids, really. Um, it has a lot to do with Excel power queries. That's how it started. And then it becomes a dashboard reporting tool. It's very powerful. Soon about dashboard, creating graphs from tabular data sets. Anyone is aware of SQL Server reporting services? Yes. yes. That is it on Azure. That's what it means on Azure. So in Power BI, I will need to create a, a workspace. And I will call the workspace Bootcamp. Don't worry too much about the Power BI. That's not really what, what we are here today. It's just I'm creating a new workspace. And in that workspace, I will create a data flow it's just a Power BI stuff. I'm just preparing my data to do my dashboard or to do my analysis. And I will be defining a new entity. And what I will do, the CSV file that we've seen, the 422 files, uh, record sets we have, I will need to bring it up in a storage account that I do have for you. Sorry, I can't use it. These are just uh, housekeeping. So I do have a storage account, and I think I uploaded the CSV, but if I have the kind of you won't do it right now. Because remember, once you're in Azure, you can't really access your hard drive. You are all in Azure. You have to upload everything in Azure and consume it from within Azure, OK? This is uploaded. Uh, we should have the model. Yes, the model has been now deployed. And you can see I have a swagger endpoint for it. If I take this swagger, that's the web 
service is up and running, and that is why the manifest of the web service. Now, because I do have the web service, if I go to Power BI, I just need to point it, um, I need to get the storage file. Storage file, where is the storage file? Where is the storage file? property, and I have two minutes to go. So what I'm doing on Power BI, I'm going to use this file in Power BI. There we go. So watch all the way to the right after S6, after the column S6, I'm giving you some security warning because I'm using anonymous access, which is fine, it's just an example here. Now all the way to the right side, the prediction will come. It's going to be like four digits number, 3,000, 4,000. You see the ACMI? Sorry. See the numbers? So these are the predictions. So what happened with Power BI did, it went through every single row, called the web service, passed over 10 parameters, get the outcome parameter, put it on the column. That's the prediction values. Okay? The beauty is I didn't put a record code to can you see it from Power BI? That's the goal. Okay. We are a couple minutes over time. I will be hanging in the back if you guys have any questions. Other than that, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.